Welcome back from lunch, everyone. Please give another warm welcome to our next speaker, Monica, who's going to take us into the virtual world. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome back from lunch. I thought it would be fun to start on a light note, you know, as you came back, with like, bellies full and all. I thought let's start with a song, you know, to wake you up a little. Um, we'll be talking about virtual worlds and how to build them using web technologies. A uh, few words about who I am and where I came from. Uh, my name is Monica, and I'm a software engineer based in Zurich, Switzerland. And up until recently, as in a few years ago, I had no idea what virtual reality was. Then I tried uh, Oculus, the first one, Oculus Rift, and I felt sick within 10 seconds. So that was a win. Um, however, as the time went by and the technology got better, and the company where I worked, um, called Archaeologic, a small company based in Zurich, Switzerland, um, started working on 3D models on the web, 3D models of buildings, apartments, and we also worked on making it all VR ready. So um, there I kind of got into the whole VR scene and so on. And then this happened. And uh, this was actually also quite recently in November or so. And I got to try the, the HoloLens, which for the first time I was wearing a headset that didn't make me feel sick at all. And uh, since then I'm a fan, so yay. <laughs> so that's a bit about me. And now, back to the topic. I'll be talking about how to build virtual worlds with web technologies. In the morning, from what I've also heard, uh, the talks were quite technical and a bit like, difficult. But mine is going to be a bit more fun. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean, I didn't mean like, not that other people's talks were not fun. It's more like mine is a bit more silly. Um, so, there are two parts. To, to what I'll be doing. The first part is the virtual on the web. And what are, what are we talking about, right? So we have the scale from the real world all the way to the virtual world. And uh, we are right there in the real world. It's sometimes fun, sometimes not. But the further to the right we go, uh, the more fun it gets, maybe. Uh, so we are on the... We go uh, through augmented reality, mixed reality, all the way towards the virtual reality. And the more to the right we go, the more immersion we get. So with the augmented reality, we have external sort of information or things coming in to us. And with the virtual reality, we are brought into the virtual world. So we're talking about the web, right? And um, web and virtual reality or augmented reality or mixed reality on the web is a great thing. It's fantastic because it gives us, gives us the opportunity to share whatever applications we have widely without having any sort of uh, blockers, like having it just on Steam and only available on HTC Vive or something. You know, so we have a wide variety of devices where we can show, show our work. And, uh, this has been enabled by something that was up until recently known as WebVR, web and uh, now it's WebXR. So, what's WebXR? WebXR device API is a um, JavaScript API implemented by the browsers that enables us to detect headsets. So, from your application, you can see whether a user is using a headset, and if so, what kind of capabilities the headset has. Uh, it also allows us to get the orientation and position of the headset, if that, is, that information is available, and also gives us access to the controllers. So, we can use those in our web-based applications. When it comes to the av availability and support in the browsers, um, it's been getting better and better. Uh, funnily enough, when you look at a picture and compare you know, Edge and uh, Chrome, that's kind of funny, right? Usually it tends to be the other way around, I think. Um, <laughs> so the support is in many browsers. Uh, some of them, however, are only limited to certain devices. So you don't get the full capabilities. For example, with the newest Samsung Internet, they only officially support um, the Samsung Gear VR. Um, yeah, such as, yeah, the same thing with uh, 
Chrome, they mostly focus on the um, on the what is it called? Google Daydream. Yes, but the support has been getting better and better. So that's good, right? And how about the virtual worlds part then? Um, it's all good that we have the API, but how do we make content to actually make use of the API? When we say virtual worlds, I think of games. And you saw the video at the beginning, right? It wasn't completely random. Um, I got this inspiration about two weeks ago. Uh, has anybody heard of this game? Yes, a bunch of people. Yay, who's a fan? Yay, yay. OK, I, I'm happy I'm not the only one, because it's a very silly game. Uh, it's called Katamari Damacy. It was first made, I think, for PlayStation. And the concept is very simple. So what you get is, is this uh, uh, silly character with a ball, and the character rolls the ball in the world and rolls things onto it. And the ball keeps growing, and it grows and grows. And the bigger the ball is, the bigger things it can roll onto it. And the goal of the game is make the ball grow so big that you can roll the entire universe into it. And yeah, so it's, yeah, that's kind of weird, right? Why did I come up with that? Um, yeah, I made a little demo. And I decided to walk you through how to make your own. In this demo, I took inspiration from Katamari. And I made a little character that walks on a ball. I was like, OK, let's not be too literal with the pushing. But we have a character that walks on a ball, and the ball goes around the place, rolling stuff. And uh, the, the more stuff it rolls, the bigger it grows. And on this, we'll show all sorts of things that we can do with the web VR, and maybe I'll inspire you to make your own little silly games. So let's build this, and in 3D, it's going to be fun, right? So what web technologies are we going to use? We're going to use WebGL, but not directly, and I'll show you in a bit why. Um, that allows us to render 3D graphics, give access to the graphics card, and we're going to use the WebXR API. Now, why wouldn't we not use WebGL directly? Um, of course, there's nothing against it. It's great. But uh, for many people, it might be a bit tedious or not really something they would want to spend too much time doing. Because just for um, rendering this image, which is just a 2D image, there's no 3D in here, if we just use HTML and put a div on a black background and make it wide with a bit of an offset. Um, yeah, it's seven lines. If we write the WebGL code, <laughs> it's a little bit more. Um, my slides will have a link to the actual code, so you can check it out. Um, yes, so fortunately for that, fortunately for <laughs> us, we have A-Frame to kind of help us with that. How many of you have heard about A-Frame? Probably a lot, yeah. How about maybe 40, 50 percent. Uh, so A-Frame is a web framework which gives us the opportunity to make use of WebGL and WebXR in a way that's very simple compared to what you just saw. Uh, so what we have is uh, basically HTML-based components that we can combine into scenes and create these virtual worlds quite easily. It's easy to get started. Uh, there's an amazing community that's very active, and there are lots of resources available. And there's even like a Slack channel, and everybody like posts their little uh, applications there, and everybody's very supportive and happy. And the documentation for A-Frame is great, so I definitely recommend it. And A-Frame uh, allows us to, to basically build these applications without having to worry about all the boilerplates, about setting up defaults, about um, you know, putting the controls in. So it has everything built in just when you start off. Um, as I said before, we're on the web, so it's cross-platform. Cross now, a uh, funny thing we, uh, I read a few months ago, actually, that uh, HoloLens supports web uh, VR now, and I have not tried it yet. And, and just before my talk, I noticed that there is a HoloLens at the Microsoft stand. So after the talk, I might go try it out. Um, last time I tried it, it didn't work, even though officially it should have. Uh, so we'll see. I'll let you know. Um, so what we have is entity component architecture. So we can take a bunch of components and put them together. And um, 
we can mix them together, make mixes and reuse things, and it's, it's very, very nice and clean. The performance has been optimized for the web, so that's also nice. And uh, if you're using any sort of front-end frameworks like React, Angular, whatever, Vue.js, it doesn't matter. It's, we're just talking HTML here, right? So it's, it's all good. The clicker is dead. Or my computer is dead. OK. So what does a basic A-frame application look like? If you've never seen it, I think just looking at this kind of gives you an idea that it's not too complex. So what we have is we have our HTML file where we import the A-frame library and just add an A scene, as an A-frame scene. This gives us a bunch of defaults already. It gives us a default camera, default, light, default lighting, it gives us uh, uh, WASD controls, um, you know, look controls, and so on. And uh, even gives us a little VR button so that we can click on it and get into VR mode if we have a VR-ready device. If it's a, if it's a laptop, you just get, go into full screen. Um, what we have is the components. So inside of the A scene, we have entities. Entities are like like empty boxes that then we can put stuff into to make them visible. So entity is like a, let's think of like a div, empty div. When you put a div into your HTML, you can't really see that unless you put something in it. So this is the same thing. If you have an empty entity, it doesn't visually show up. So components give us either the, the so the 3D objects and so like geometry, or, or give us material, or we can also specify position, and so, so all sorts of properties um, for this entity. And attributes then more specify the components. So for geometry, for example, we can say, yeah, I would like a sphere, right? So primitive sp sphere. A-frame has a bunch of primitives, so you don't really have to say A entity, geometry, primitive sphere. You can say A sphere. And it, uh, there are primitives for a bunch of basic 3D objects like spheres, boxes, uh, I mean cubes, um, planes, torus, a bunch of them. Um, so you can use those out of the box. Um, other attributes could be like color. If you are using any sort of uh, textures, which I'll get to in a bit, uh, you can also put the, the source files in there, like links to the, to the files and so on. With position, you can add the coordinates and so on. So that being said, let's look at how we build the game or what steps do we need to take. First of all, when we add the, the entities into our scene, uh, we need to know where to position them. We need to know where to put them and how to rotate them to make everything visible in a way we want. Um, normally, the, the units are in meters. So in A-frame, when, when you say you know, x coordinate is 1, it means 1 meter. When it comes to the coordinates, though, y is the vertical, and z is the coordinate that goes into the screen. So that's a bit, I, I had a, at the beginning a bit of a trouble kind of getting used to that, but basically what it is is that if something is coming from the screen at you, it's coming towards you, so it's plus, and if it's going away, it's minus. So that's kind of good to know so that when you position your I don't know, first box into the scene, you want it to be at like negative one, negative three um, Z coordinates so that you see it in front of you. And then the rotation, that's another, another story, making things rotate in the direction you want, that's always fun. Um, yeah, so it be. If you use your right hand, it's like, it's like in physics. I don't know if you remember in physics when they were teaching us about uh, gravitational forces and so on, or whatever, magnetic forces. I'm sorry, I don't even remember. Last time I did physics was like 20 years ago. Um, yeah. The second thing we do is we look at the materials. So if we just put some sort of primitives in our scene, like in this case, this is a sphere. Now, this looks like a 2D image. It's very flat. But this is actually a screenshot from an A-frame uh, application uh, of a sphere. It looks completely flat. You could not tell that it's 3D. There is no material on it. But once we add a material with just pink color, already we'll have a more like round, nice, 3D-looking um, sphere. And once we add a uh, texture, it's even nicer. So what's a texture? If I don't know if you know much about these things, that who knows what the texture is? 
Oh, nice, almost everybody. Okay, so who doesn't? It's, it's a 2D image that we map onto the surface on of a of a 3D object, so it's like wrapping a present, basically. So we take 2D and through a process called texture mapping, map it onto the 3D object. All right, now you saw in the, in the screenshot I posted of the, of the demo that I had a bunch of um, models, 3D models, that were not primitives, they were not spheres. I had one sphere, but then I had the character, and I had some cats there, and some hot air balloons, so the hot air balloon and the cat I found on Google Poly. So if you're looking for sources for 3D models, there are many. You can just Google for like 3D model and you know, find, find a whole bunch of them. You can go to Sketchfab or TurboSquid or Google Poly. What you want to look into, though, is uh, the formats. So uh, there are different formats of 3D models that you can use. There's FBX, there's OBJ, um, there's the Collada model, there's a, a GLTF. And the preferable um, format is GLTF for the web. It's a, it's a format that's being pushed now by the Kronos group, and it's a binary format, which makes it better for performance. It also supports animations, as we see with the cesium man here on the right. Um, so we have these three models. But you know, since everybody makes models differently, uh, they do not always have the same size, right? So what we want to make sure is that we scale and position them correctly. Otherwise, this could happen. So I imported the cat into my scene. And then I got this. I'm like, OK, what's going on, OK? Zoom out. It's, yeah, I mean, it is a cat. It's, it looks great, right? Um, it's, yeah, it's all nice, nice and great, but it's massive. So in the end, I had to scale it to 0 0.2, I think, so that it shrinks a little and changes position also because it was halfway through the ground. But yeah, that's something to think of. So if you, if you end up with something like this, know that it's probably because the, the scale is wrong. If you can't see that all in your scene, it might be because the position is negative, like the Y position is negative, so it might be somewhere like way, way down underneath, and uh, yeah, it's hard to find, right? Physics. So another part of the game that, uh, that I showed you was that uh, we have the ball that goes around and rolls things, right? So for my demo, the big ball, anytime it collides with like a cat or the, or the hot air balloon, it grows. And for this, I need to get collisions, right? So there's, fortunately for us, there's a component for this. And it's the physics component. Now, something, something, sorry, something to keep in mind is that when we use physics, there, there are two sort of attributes that we can use for our objects. It's the static body and dynamic body from the physics uh, component. Static body is for the objects which collide but do not get affected by the collision, really, that stay static, like the ground or if you have a tree or something. And dynamic bodies get displaced. So if there's a crash, the dynamic body flies off. And uh, what I did once I put in the physics into my demo, um, I was like, OK, where are all the cats? And as I said before, the, what happened was that they fell through the ground and kept on falling, because gravity, right? So my solution was, let's set gravity to zero. <laughs> Good idea, eh? <laughs> uh, this is the result, by the way. It's fun. Test it out, play around with it. It's beautiful. Uh, so the cat had the dynamic body, and there was no static body in the scene, and gravity was set to zero. So. I'll show you the code in a bit, but yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. So you want to put, the, uh, put some sort of static body underneath so that the, the objects don't fall through. Now, the last thing that we want to add is some sort of user interactions. So uh, what I added is, is jumping, because jumping is always fun. And uh, uh, I did it on acceleration, so if you use your mobile phone, as, as your VR device and put it, for example, in a Google Cardboard or any cardboard, um, and you jump, it picks up on the acceleration change, and you jump in the VR as well. And then I also put a space bar. Um, and so if you press space bar on your computer, it also does that. You can, of course, also use um, the controllers of any VR 
headset that you might have. So that's also an option, and it's uh, basically the same same concept. On top of this, uh, I added a couple more components. So there was the environment component, which I didn't put in because I forgot. But uh, since I'm not an artist, I'm a developer, making something look pretty is hard. And uh, fortunately for me, somebody made these preset environments uh, where if you import a component called environment, a firm environment, uh, you can just say, hey, make it look nice, and it does. Um, I added animations, which is another um, another component. So I added animation to the, to the ball that is rolling, and also to make it move over the place. And I added sound, because sounds are fun. Uh, so whenever you jump, you hear a sound, and there's background sound, because you saw the video at the beginning that was kind of wonky. Uh, so that will be nice. And G-Block for importing um, Google Poly models. So there's, there's built-in support for OBJ um, and GLTF in A-Frame. If you're using FBX or, or Google Poly or something, you need to use external components. Fortunately for us, the, the component ecosystem is huge, and you can make your own components. It's actually uh, not too difficult. Um, there are lots of tutorials, and uh, yeah, the community is also great. Everybody is kind of working on making things nicer and better. So that's all good. All right. So we have this overview. And what do we do with it? So let's have a look at uh, what we can do, right? So I have an HTML file here um, that has the title of Awesome Game, because it's going to be awesome, right? Um, and uh, we imported the A-Frame library. I have it stored locally, because you never know with the internet. And for now, there is no A scene. I just have a header that says, hello, Webberball. So, so ta-da. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, I know it took me a lot of time to make this, right? Pretty. Uh, OK, so let's try to do something nice here, actually. So I'm going to remove this and add an uh, A scene. Now, as I said, the A scene already gives us some basics, right? It gives us the camera, lights, and controls. So I'm going to save this. And um, if we go back and reload, look at that. We have the button here. Yay, enter VR mode with headset, or full screen mode on desktop. So when I press it, it just goes into full screen, and there's nothing, so there's no point, really. But what I can show you is the A-frame inspector, which is great also when you're trying to find your lost 3D models that might be somewhere underground. So when you press Control-Alt-I, uh, you get into the A-frame inspector. Now, uh, what you have here, and I'm going to zoom in a little, zoom in a little. OK. So uh, can you see it back there a little? Basically, what it says is that there's an A scene. I didn't hear any responses, so I assume that nobody's complaining. So. Uh, so we have a camera here, and we have two lights. OK, there's one light, there's second light, and here's the camera. What we can do is we can actually come here and even move them around. So it's nice if you don't want to think about you know, what is the position, and the position is you know, relative to where the camera is. So camera is 0, 0, 1.6. So 1.6 is Y, so that's like basically where your eyes are, more or less. Um, Anyway, so you can move things around. And if you go to the right, there you have details of the entities. And you can also edit stuff here, so you can also manually change the position and so on. You know, it's a camera. You can change a bunch of attributes. And we have the look controls. So the look controls enable us, when I go back, back to scene. Um, OK, when I go back to scene, now we can't see it, but I can basically move around with the mouse and, and yeah, look around the scene. OK, but let's do something more fun, right? Let's add that sphere that we talked about. So I'm going to use the uh, A-sphere primitive. And because we want to be able to see the sphere, let's say 
uh, material, okay, if only I could type, uh, color pink. So we have the color that's pink, that's like what we had before. And let's also set a position. And position is going to be, so we set x, y, z. So x, y, let's say 1, and z negative in front of us, let's say minus 3. Okay? So let's see what happens now. I'll reload the page. Ta-da! Okay. Yeah, no, not very exciting. Right? So we have the ball here, and now you can see that we can actually move around. So these are the look controls that come built in. Okay, so we've got this. We're almost done with the game, right? No, not quite. Okay, so let me show you what the game actually looks like. I'm not going to live code the whole thing because that would take me forever. And I only have a limited amount of time, 15 minutes now, 10 minutes. So let me show you what we have. So. Uh, I have a couple of imports, and I don't know why this looks ugly. Okay, so uh, I have a couple of imports, which is the A-frame, and you see up here. So I have A-frame, I have the environment component, which I said makes the environment pretty. Uh, I have the A-frame extras, which are like extra components that might be nice and useful. Uh, you also have things like ocean there and so on if you want to play around with it. Uh, and then I have the physics. So in the scene, I add a physics because I'm going to be using it afterwards. And, and the next step is to put the assets in. So what you can do with assets, you don't need to uh, put them directly, put the URLs directly into your entities because that's also kind of not so nice to look at. Um, you can preload them. There is an entity called A Assets, into which you can put all the all the assets that you will be using, and it um, well preloads them for you so that you can then use them in your in your code. So I have the cesium man, which is the GLTF model. I have a stripy texture. And I have some sounds. It's going to be nice. Um, as you see, we have um, A assets for, for whatever, and then audio for, for, our, for our audio files. So setting up environment is actually easy. As I told you, that, that hey, I just used the environment component and set the default, right? It's like one line, right? Two words, three words. Uh, so that's very nice. And uh, I'm going to yeah. let me show you what it looks like here. Yeah. So in this bit we have <laughs> we have the environment. The environment came like this. That's the default, and I like the colors because they're kind of funky. It comes with the mushrooms as well. But uh, what I have here is my sphere, which I textured. I put a striped, striped texture on it, and it's rolling, so it's already an animation. And let me just show you what that looks like. Um, okay. So what that looks like is here I have the sphere, which is horizontal stripes as its material. So in material, in the previous one, I just said color pink. And here I just say horizontal stripes. So I can reference the assets just by ID. And I set the position. I set it to cast shadow and uh, give it a static body. And that's what I talked before with the physics. Static body, dynamic body. So with the ball, it's going to crash into things. So we want the, the static body to be there. I say the mass is. 2,000 kilos, I think it's in kilos, so big, heavy. Um, and it's going to be the shape of a sphere. And uh, there is a sound here, sound component, and source is a meow file, and I might kind of tell you what it's going to do, but we'll see it in a bit. Autoplay, we set the autoplay to false or true. So for the, for the generic sound that you, you know, hear, you heard the song, pum, 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 that there I set the autoplay to true. But here it's false, because I tie it to an event. So it happens only when there's a meow event. And 
we'll see when that happens. Um, so yeah, as I said before, the, the background sound is, is the la la, na la la, also play true. A loop I said false because I could also set it to true so that it just keeps on going. But then I thought, you know, I'll have it open in a separate tab and it'll just keep on going, maybe a bit too annoying. And the best part about it is that you can set the position and the volume. So a fantastic thing about sounds is that if you tie a sound component to a different entity, for example, you'll have a player that says something, um, the sound goes with this entity. So the further you are, the quieter it gets, the closer you go, the louder it gets. So that's kind of nice. And you can place the sounds where you want in the space, so you get the spatial audio. And you can set the volume, of course. And in this case, the sound is just underneath the scene. So we have the scene, and here we have the sound. OK. One thing I kind of skipped over is, um, is that we can nest entities. And you might kind of mm, know the concept from elsewhere that when you have an entity, it can have child entities, the same as in HTML. Um, so whatever happens to the parent entity happens to the child as well. So when you need to position things, you can position them relat relative to, to one another. And then you can apply, for example, an animation on both of them simultaneously. So in this case, I have a sphere, and the sphere has an animation as a child component. And that's the rotation. So with animations, the great part is that you can animate anything. You can animate colors, you can animate position, you can animate rotation. And you just say where you want to animate from and where you want to animate to. And it's kind of nice, because if you have colors, you can say animate from white to red. And it's just going to go from white to red. And it's, and it's super nice. So um, very, very um, useful. And here I just say that I want it to repeat forever, um, just so that it keeps on rolling. And there's a linear easing, which means, um, you know, with moving, for example, if you, if you throw a ball in the air, as it goes up, it slows down a little until it stops, and then it goes down and speeds up, right? So we don't want that with the ball, because it just go like, Faster, 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 and then slow and stuff. Faster, faster? Yeah, so we don't want that. We want it to move on kind of uniformly. OK. Let's move on to our avatar. As I said, there is built-in support for GLTF models. So in this case, I just set its ID to Walker and say that the GLTF model um, component is the CCM man, which I put into, into my assets up there. And I just reference it by ID. Set the position, rotation, and so on. Here I have a score entity as a, as a child entity. And that's what I said. When you tie two entities together, you can set their position relative to one another. So in this case, I want the score, which is the size of the ball, to float above the head of the walker. So it took me a while with the, with the A-frame inspector to kind of get the positions right, so that it kind of shows up nicely. But worked, so it's nice. There's a text component. Um, which is also useful, where I can just say what I want uh, there to be. Value is the actual test, uh, text. So at the beginning, the, the sphere is one meter large, and then it grows, and then I update it in the in JavaScript file. So the avatar, which is the player, and the ball move in a circle around the center point. So in this case, I animate rotation again, direction forwards, and I say to where, so, so that they just go in a circle, and also forever. What is good to see here is that there is a duration, and the duration is not for how long it will happen, because you see that it, the repeat is indefinite. Um, the duration basically tells you how long the one rotation should take, which means that the bigger the number, the slower the movement, the slower the animation. So that's... That's nice, so we, we have it nice and slow, going in a circle. It also takes a bit of experimentation to get it right. Also kind of synchronizing the, uh, my avatar with the, um, with the ball, so that they move at the same pace. Because the, the avatar, the, the walker, came with an animation built in. And I think I skipped over that here. Yes, so here I have the walker. GLTF model, da -di -da -da, and I added animation mixer. 
So Animation Mixer basically turns on the animation that comes with the GLTF model. And since it had a certain speed, I then had to synchronize the ball and so on. Yes, and now jump and fall. So for the jump, that's also an animation. And I say that it begins on jump. So we have jump events. And this is also a nice thing. All the animations and sounds you can tie to uh, events. You can have events. It's like having an event listener built in there. And uh, um, in this case, we change the position. And here I just say, first we go five meters up, and then we go five meters down. And yeah, and the second one comes with a delay. So it goes up, and then the second animation only happens uh, 0.3 seconds afterwards. So that you know they don't happen at the same time, which would you know, not work very well. And close of the entity, which is the walker and the ball and all the animations and the score. So we have them all wrapped up in one entity. And close the A scene, and that's it here. So here it looks like quite a bit. I also linked the uh, the code so that you can test it out, play around with it. And uh, yeah, then we have the JavaScript file. So as you saw, I went through all these things in my code, but there was no no cat, no hot air balloons. So I do that in the in the JavaScript file. So. Let's, I'll just skip over this. I calculate random positions and rotations in a circle, OK? Because I'm making the avatar move in a circle around the camera. And I just want to position things more or less randomly. So, so I, there is a, an angle calculation and so on. And it's just not important, random placement. And then I randomly pick whether I'm putting a cat in or, or the, the balloon. and. The nice thing is that also from JavaScript, I can create uh, these entities. So I just say document create entity, and then add attributes. So I said it's ID, I said it's class, I said dynamic body, and then I said the position, and uh, where is it? There's position, ah, and the G block. So what I said was the Google poly blocks. So I can change everything from here. I add event listener collision, which comes with a physics component. So whenever there is a collision, uh, collision, um, oh no, not collision, collide event is, is um, fired. So I have the collide event where I grow the ball, the, the sphere, the radius, the radius I increase, I increase the position so that all the positions kind of stick up. And uh, yeah, I changed all the attributes to make things work and remove the the collided object that's here. And update the scoreboard. OK. Last bit, since we're running out of time. I have two event listeners here for the jumps. I have the key down and then device motion. So that's also nice, which you uh, think that you can access, um, is the device motion. And as I said, it's for the phone when you jump up. I take the acceleration, and I check whether it's uh, it is over a certain threshold that I just set up. It's also trial and error. And then I make a jump. And yeah, and I just add all my, I call it bounty because I collect it and it's like getting bounty. And uh, yeah, so that's the cats and that's the balloons. So this is my code. It's two files, OK? Um, And the final results you can also check online. It's all on Glitch. You can remix it, make changes, make it all nice and great. And I'm, I'm going to show it to you because I'm a nice person. So as you can see, the collide event causes the cat to meow. Now, where is the player? Oh, no. Where is the player? It just keeps on going in a circle. So here, the ball is now 1.8 meters. And now I just absorbed a cat. OK, balloon, balloon. Got it. It's a very exciting game. Oh, yes. So. <laughs> I was like, collect them all, right? It's like Pokemon. So. Uh, yeah, I could play this for hours because I'm into silly games, but uh, 
Feel free to make changes, edit, remix this on Glitch. I'll pose my slides so that you can also get a, something out of this afterwards. There's also no meowing when, when it absorbs the hot air balloons. Because, and yeah. <laughs> this is what I was saying, the keeps on going forever. Here are some resources and inspiration. Have a look at uh, the Im Immersive Web Weekly, which is a new newsletter going on for two weeks or so now, three weeks, third week now. There's Super Medium, which is a new VR-only browser wh where you have linked VR ex web VR experiences. So it's all available in VR, which is also awesome. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. OK. All right. And I think this was maybe the first Glitch link I saw. And Glitch is fantastic. So it's I'm great, isn't it? So I really like it. it there. Yeah. I like that you can you know, write your code, and then you just open it in another tab uh, and see it live, how it changes, and you can share it, and multiple people can work on it. Yeah. So it's yeah, one of my favorite tools. All right. We have a couple of questions. Um, can you use React with this? As far as I know, yes. <laughs> I've never tried it, though. But I'm pretty sure you, you can. Officially, you can. So it should be easily possible. Yeah. yeah. OK. And do you know if screen readers work with A-Frame? That's what I was also wondering. We had this, uh, there was also this question yesterday for the, uh, during the accessibility talk, whether, you know, how it works with VR and so on. And I actually don't know what the state of the art there is. Yeah. And I, wonder, and I, wish, I wish it worked. Somehow, but I'm, I'm not sure. I know some people made custom VR experiences where they made it possible for people to just go through it uh, just using audio. So I think it's, it's, it could be the simil a similar concept to like making the applications progr uh, like progressively enhanced, right? So making it possible to just go through with the audio. And you have the spatial audio, right? So that's also kind of nice that if when you walk through, you could, you could get yeah. the, the audio inputs even if you don't get the visuals. So. Screen readers, I don't know, though. Yeah. OK. All right. So oh, this is my question. <laughs> <laughs> I like that the inspiration came from this other game. And so yes. I was just curious if there were other games <laughs> that you like that you think are, that could inspire people that they might want to check out. I think I'm kind of special in this in this game thing because I get motion sickness with most games. So I can't play like first person shooters or any sort of computer games, really. Uh, I, I like like silly games where really you don't do not do that much, where it's kind of slow, like made for kids and so on. So I don't think I'm the best person to ask this. <laughs> OK. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. It was lovely to be here. Yeah.